this is a moment where once again all of us across the country are asking the question about what kind of country do we want to be uh, and do we want to be the jahapana that he spoke about uh, so let me start with actually uh, the words of swami vivekanand uh, in his historic address to the world's parliament of religions in chicago in 1893 he said i'm proud to belong to a nation which has sheltered the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all nations of the earth it's extraordinary that a government which claims uh, swami vivekanand as its greatest icon has created a citizenship law which has just two filters to accepting the persecuted and the refugees and those are the filters of religion and nation precisely what swami vivekanand said he felt proud of being of belonging to a nation which did not have these filters when it welcomed the persecuted uh and this hap this is 126 years after his iconic speech uh a great deal uh, including the president of india in his address to parliament claimed that mahatma gandhi had wanted uh us to have uh, a legal framework which for hindus who are persecuted in uh, pakistan Radmohan Gandhi who is his biographer and his grandson uh, wrote a piece saying this is a brazen lie and uh, i was moved by what he said he said what mahatma gandhi really wanted he said his dream was to see a 50 mile line of people of sikhs and hindus returning from pakistan to india and of muslims uh, uh so, so, sorry six si, uh, si, and hindus returning to pakistan and muslims from pakistan returning to india he had a very very different idea and if he had lived beyond his assassination that is exactly what he said he said he would go without a visa to pakistan uh, and 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 so so we have these different imaginations playing out uh looking back to the time of independence uh jawaharlal nehru chose not to sign uh in the refugee convention uh, the 1951 con- convention for the protection of refugees and that's something that i find extremely curious uh because uh, jawaharlal nehru was uh, an international statesperson respected for the moral stance he took uh and yet he chose not to sign the refugee convention the convention firstly defines refugees as persons fleeing prosecution persecution on grounds of race religion nationality social group or political op- opinion secondly it gives refugees legal rights the most important of which is the right of what is called non refoulement which prevents states from sending back refugees to persecution in their home countries and it also accords refugees a range of secondary rights such as the right to education to work to livelihoods uh, and, and so on but india has long argued and i think with with good ground at least when jawaharlal nehru was leading us that we may not have signed the refugee convention but in practice we are one of the leading refugee receiving countries of the world refugees in india include uh, sri lankan tamils tibetans from china chin minorities from burma the hindus from bangladesh and pakistan so it might legitimately be asked that if india has been hospitable to refugees why do we need to sign the refugee convention the answer i think is very clear particularly uh for two things uh, in recent history one is our to my mind completely unconscionable decision to return seven rohingya men uh, uh last 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 winter uh to uh to myanmar and the second of course is the citizenship amendment act 
There are many problems with Indian law in relation to refugees, not just that we have not signed the Refugee Convention. Our law does not distinguish between foreigners and refugees. This means that refugees depend, have no rights as refugees. They are like, treated like any other foreigner. They're de dependent, therefore, on benevolence rather than on inherent rights. Uh, the second is that the law, in a sense, assumes that the executive will be driven by principles of humanism and non-discrimination in relation to uh, refugees. Uh, that might have been true for an India that was led by Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, governments since have had a mixed record. And today we have a government which is ideologically hostile to Muslims in India and in the neighborhood, and which does believe that India should be the natural home, not of all persecuted people, but of persecuted Hindus, uh, in the way that Israel is uh, the natural home of, of the Jews. In the absence of explicit recognition in Indian law of the category of refugees or their legally binding rights, even the guarantees of the fundamental rights to equality and non-discrimination, uh, which apply not just, to, uh, 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 not just to citizens but to all persons, have not prevented India from uh, violating this core principle of non-refoulement. Uh, in the case of, of the Rohingyas. Let us rewind to that case. And uh, Prashant is here, and I'm sure he'll speak about it, because he was the lawyer who fought this case. And Cheryl, who's somewhere here in the audience, uh, was with him on this. Uh, it was uh, in, 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 in the autumn of 2018, seven repatriated Rohingya men were just hours away from the border from Myanmar when human rights activists came to know about this. They, he, they were actually on their way. And it was a very dramatic hearing where, uh, where the, the lawyers rushed to the Supreme Court and said, they're just hours away. Uh, they're Rohingya men. They're going to be sent back to, uh, to Myanmar uh, and to plead with uh, the Supreme Court to stop them from being thrown merciless, mercilessly into a genocidal situation. The Supreme Court bench, which included just Chief Justice Ranjan Gogoi, refused to stop their deportation. It based its ruling primarily on an affidavit that claimed that Myanmar had accepted the refugees as citizens and that the men had orally accepted being repatriated. Uh, this, you know, the situation was that these men were in detention centers in Assam uh, for many years. So even if, firstly, they had no legal counsel, uh, there was no question of them having any legal counsel, whether they were informed about their rights. And, 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 and secondly, if your choice is between being Ill, in detention centers for the rest of your life and maybe just taking a chance, many of us might have made the choice that those men made but could it be seen as really a, a free choice and a reasonable choice that was presented to them? Uh, the media later report, and they, were, they crossed the borders. Uh, I remember Cheryl was weeping, uh, actually crying when, when, when this happened. And she said, they've gone, they've, go they've crossed the borders. Yes. Uh, the media later reported that these men have, have been detained in Myanmar for illegal entry. They were not given. Uh, uh, you know, they were given, uh, instead of citizenship rights, they were given national verification cards uh, that do not, which are notorious because they do not recognize their religion or their ethnicity, and we do not know what happened to them after that. I believe that this is something that should sit on the conscience of every Indian. Uh, the fact that we sent back Rohingya men into a situation uh, which is which we know to be genocidal. And if we had any doubts, on the 23rd of January uh, this year, the International Court of Justice passed a ruling which, in very equivocal terms, said ro the Rohingya face genocidal intent in Myanmar. The case against Myanmar was brought, brought to the International Court by a small South uh, African Muslim nation called the Gambia. 
uh, and uh, the, the International Court uh, rejected uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's testimony on behalf of her government, where she described the allegations of the Gambia as incomplete and misleading. The World Court warned the, milit the Myanmar military against any conspiracy to commit genocide and directed Myanmar authorities to take steps to protect its minority Rohingya population from genocide. For the Indian government and the Supreme Court, I believe this judgment should be a moment for both introspection and atonement. But this it will not be. The government has never referred to the Rohingya as refugees, but as illegal immigrants, security threats, and potential terror threats. They have not been included, as we know, as being eligible for citizenship under the 2009 amendment, 2019 amendment because of their religion and the country of their origin. Instead, they are often the subject of community charged political stigmatization by the ruling party and its supporters amidst calls for the expulsion of the desperately impoverished tiny population of around 40,000 Rohingya refugees subsisting by picking, picking rags at the lowest end labor in dismal shanties unsupported by the Indian state. Our treatment of the Rohingyas and the discriminatory CAA must compel Indians committed to an India as a humane and inclusive country to fight not just for the abrogation of the CAA, NR, IC, NPR, Trinity, but also for India to bring in a refugee law which conforms to international conventions. This is uh, what I believe, and this is what I hope that we will go on to debate. What would this mean? This would first recognize eligible, undocumented immigrants. The word illegal immigrant is something that, that is not even, should not even be used. Uh, we should talk, call them undocumented immigrants as refugees. Should, they should be recognized based on evidence, by, and that evidence should be collected by due process of their persecution in their home countries. It would assure them of a set of binding rights. The most important of them is that they would not be forced to return to conditions of persecution, threatening their lives and liberty from where they had escaped. The second that would be that they would be assured lives of dignity within India with education, health care, and livelihoods. Uh, these debates have, have, have unfolded in, you know, in, in the last month and a half. And very often, when people are defending uh, the CA, and, and I say, why not uh, a law then that accepts all persecuted people? The answer is that India is not a dharam salam. Uh, so I, once again, I want to remind them of what Swami Vivekanand said. Would India become a country which Swami Vivekanand was so proud of? A haven to the persecuted of the world, untainted by discrimination based on religion and nation. Thank you.